in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for this evening, this opportunity to be together, to dive into your word. And we pray, Lord, whatever it is that we are carrying tonight, whatever worry, anxiety, fear, anger, bitterness, resentment, whatever might be weighing on us, or anything that might just be distracting us from this time, we ask, Lord, that you give us a spirit of freedom to let those things go, to lay them at your feet, and to allow us to be completely attentive to you tonight. You knew each one of us would be here, and your Holy Spirit has a message in store for each one of us. And so we pray that we would be open, ready to receive, ready to listen, and to hear whatever those words are. Guide us in our study and in our discussion, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us, especially as we reflect on this very serious and somber reading of the Passion, that you would help us remember the gravity of your love for us, that you would go this far and even further to call us back to you, to reconcile us to you. And so we thank you, Lord, tonight for that gift of offering your life for us on the cross, of rising from the dead, all the things that we are about to celebrate in the coming weeks of Holy Week and Easter. Let none of it be lost on us. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good evening and welcome back. Well, welcome if you're the first time here. It's good to see you. Tonight we're in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. We're going to read all the rest of 22 and all of chapter 23, because that is the gospel reading for this Sunday. However, we're only going to do it once. I know we usually do it twice, but we're only going to do it once. So, doing so, we are going to try and do this very prayerfully, reverently. Um, we're going to try and really enter into this story and into this text so, so that we can get the most out of it. And so this, as I've said many times before, is one that you have definitely heard over and over and over again. We all hear it at least once or twice a year, and it is one of the most fundamental stories of our faith. And so try and delete, if you can, any previous images you have of this story. We're going to walk along this way of Jesus with him. Um, and see what you notice. And really, I want to encourage you, engage your senses in this. Um, really pay attention to what do you see, what do you hear, what do you smell, what do you taste, what do you feel, what are characters do you identify with, where do you see yourself in the scene. Try and really make this come to life for you. And many things may stand out, so please feel free, underline, even if you borrowed a Bible, underline, highlight, take notes, so you can really reflect on the things that resonate with you or any questions that you have. So, without further ado, we're going to start in chapter 22, verse 14, Gospel of Luke. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at table with the apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it again until there is fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that from this time on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And yet behold, the hand of the one who is to betray me is with me on this table. For the Son of Man indeed goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to debate among themselves who among them would do such a deed. Then an argument broke out among them about which of them should be regarded as the greatest. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are addressed as benefactors. But among you, it shall not be so. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. For who is greater, the one seated at table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one seated at table? I am among you as the one who serves. It is you who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer a kingdom on you, just as my Father has conferred one on me, 
that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed that your own faith may not fail. And once you have turned back, you must strengthen your brothers. Simon said to him, Lord, I am prepared to go to prison and to die with you. But he replied, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will deny me three times that you know me. He said to them, when I sent you forth without a money bag or a sack or sandals, were you in need of anything? No, nothing, they replied. Jesus said to them, but now one who has a money bag should take it. And likewise, a sack and one who does not have a sword should sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, namely, he was counted among the wicked. And indeed, what is written about me is coming to fulfillment. Then they said, Lord, look, there are two swords here. But he replied, it is enough. Then going out, Jesus went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When Jesus arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not undergo the test. After withdrawing about a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. When Jesus rose from prayer and returned to his disciples, he found them sleeping from grief. Jesus said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd approached, and in front was one of the twelve, a man named Judas. He went up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to Judas, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? His disciples realized what was about to happen, and they asked, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said in reply, Stop, no more of this. Then Jesus touched the servant's ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and temple guards and elders who had come for him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Day after day I was with you in the temple area, and you did not seize me. But this is your hour the time for the power of darkness. After arresting Jesus, they led him away and took him into a house, into the house of the high priest. Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter sat down with them. When a maid saw him seated in the light, she looked intently at him and said, this man too was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. A short while later, someone else saw Peter and said, you too are one of them. But Peter answered, my friend, I am not. About an hour later, still another insisted, assuredly, this man too was with him, for he is also a Galilean. But Peter said, my friend, I do not know what you are talking about. Just as he was saying this, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. The men who held Jesus in custody were ridiculing and beating him. They blindfolded him and questioned him, saying, Prophesy, who is that who struck you? And they reviled Jesus and saying many other things against him. When day came, the council of elders of the people met both chief priests and scribes, and they brought him before their Sanhedrin. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. But Jesus replied to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question, you will not respond. But from this time on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? Jesus replied to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further need have we for testimony? We have heard it from his own mouth. Then the whole assembly of them rose and arose and brought him before Pilate. They brought charges against Jesus, saying, 
We found this man misleading our people. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar and maintains that he is the Messiah, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him in reply, you say so. Pilate then addressed the chief priests and the crowds. I find this man not guilty. But they were adamant and said, he is inciting the people with his teaching all throughout Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to hear. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean, and upon learning that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. He had been wanting to see him for a long time, for he had heard about him and had been hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes, meanwhile, stood by, accusing Jesus harshly. Even Herod and his soldiers treated him contemptuously and mocked him. And after clothing Jesus in resplendent garb, Herod sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends that very day, even though they had been enemies formerly. Pilate then summoned the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me and accused him of inciting the people to revolt. I have conducted my investigation in your presence and have, found this man, have not found this man guilty of the charges you have brought against him, nor did Herod, for he sent him back to us. So no capital crime has been committed by him. Therefore, I shall have him flogged and then release him. But altogether they shouted out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas had been imprisoned for rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Again, Pilate addressed them, still wishing to release Jesus, but they continued their shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate addressed them a third time, What evil has this man done? I found him guilty of no capital crime. Therefore, I shall have him flogged and then release him. With loud shouts, however, they persisted in calling for Jesus' crucifixion, and their voices prevailed. The verdict of Pilate was that their demand should be granted. So he released the man who had been imprisoned for rebellion and murder, for whom they asked, and he handed Jesus over to them to deal with as they wished. As they led him away, they took hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country. And after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. A large, a large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women, who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. At that time people will say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills cover us. For if these things are done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now two others, both criminals, were led away with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified Jesus and the criminals there, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They divided Jesus' garments by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at Jesus and said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at Jesus. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. Above Jesus, there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly, for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, 
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he, when he had said this, Jesus breathed his last. The centurion who witnessed what had happened glorified God and said, This man was innocent beyond doubt. When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances stood at a distance, including the women who had followed him from Galilee and saw these events. Now there was a virtuous and righteous man, righteous man named Joseph, who, though he was a member of the council, had not consented to their plan of action. Joseph came from the Jewish town of Arimathea and was awaiting the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. After he had taken Jesus' body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a rock-hewn tomb in which no one had yet been buried. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come from Galilee with him followed behind, and when they had seen the tomb and the way in which his body was laid in it, they returned and prepared spices and perfumed oils. Then they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to reflect over that many words, but hopefully something new maybe struck you or stood out or a question that you had about this very familiar story. And so I just want to encourage you to reflect over those things, ask what is the Lord trying to say to you through this, and then bring them to discussion at your table. What stood out to you and why? What questions do you have? If you're watching this on Zoom, feel free to share that in the chat and Katie will share it with us. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, please uh, leave that in the comments as you watch. But for those of us here, take about five or ten minutes to discuss. Thank you. 
Especially, did you have about the passage? Yeah. yeah. Why did uh, Judas have to kiss Jesus in order to like signify that he was the uh, man to arrest? Yeah, I mean, I guess he could have like pounded it or something, sure. but it's, you know, culturally at the time, that was a sign of friendship. Okay. Yeah. And what's really heartbreaking is that in the Gospels, I believe the only person that Jesus directly refers to as his friend is Judas. And so it's a sign of friendship, and that kind of speaks to the real difficulty of the betrayal that happens because of that. But there also, for logistical purposes, needed to be a sign, an unspoken sign, that Jesus would have welcomed, that would have been expected, but that would have signified to the Pharisees, this is the person that you are going to arrest. Because it was dark, you know. When we see movies about you know, them in the garden of Gethsemane, it's very well lit and things, but you know this is probably like out in the middle of nowhere, no lanterns or anything, so it's you know difficult to see who is who. So it's probably for practical reasons too. Yeah, Emily. Is there a significance behind the character Joseph? Is he someone that we know, like another Joseph from previous Bible stories? Um, no, he doesn't show up before this. Um, we know that he was on the council, like on the Sanhedrin with Nicodemus, and him and Nicodemus were two um, kind of dissenters of the hatred that the council had for Jesus. Uh, and that I think there there is a uh, apocryphal writing, meaning writing that did not make it into scripture, called the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, or Nicodemus, or someone who attributes it to Nicodemus, writes about some of these same events that happened to Jesus. And so I think it became clear in some of the early church writings that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea became more prominent members of the Christian community and kind of left that role, or were trying to secretly assist um, Jesus and the early Christian community from further, further persecution. But I don't know too much beyond that. Yeah, Vicki? Yeah, we had a question at the table. Is, is this the same Herod that was... Um, killing the babies when Jesus was little, or is it another? No, that's Daddy Herod. That was Daddy. Yeah, that's that's King Herod. He's called King Herod the Great, kind of like great and terrible. Yeah, and then his um, his kingdom, he had kind of had this uh, monarchy of the whole area of of Israel. It got broken up between three of his sons. So this is one of his sons who has the, the, also the name King Herod, but he has a surname after. I can't remember if it's like Archelaus or Agrippa. Or something like that, but it's not the same Herod, but it's just the son of, of that one. Yeah. Not a great family. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. The beating of the breast, that's kind of a sign of mourning or of like a regret. So we do this at Mass, right? We say the confidier, um, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. So kind of this sense of like regret of, um, I did something wrong, I'm begging for forgiveness. Um, we still carry that in the prayers that we have at Mass. It's kind of a signifier of them saying like something wrong or unjustified happened. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce. In John uh, 6, 51, there's a reference to what Jesus said in the wilderness to his disciples and followers. And he told them a new type of food was going to come down from heaven. Mm -hmm. And that food was going to be his body and his blood. And some of them went, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that mean? You're talking cannibalism. You're nuts. And some mm -hmm. of them faded away. That's right. But Jesus knew that at the Last Supper, 
because he's eagerly thinking about it. He's finally going to reveal it, mm -hmm. right? And so when you get into this Luke, uh, he says, breaking the bread, he says, this is my body. Mm -hmm. I told you about it before. Now, right now, at this moment, we're doing it. This uh -huh. is my body. It's come to fruition. It's a, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so happy to be with you guys, because I look forward to this time to share this with you, knowing yeah. that from now on, you're going to have this way of interacting with me and being healed by me and blessed by me, etc. So interesting little thing weaving its way from the, uh, the John uh, story to this one. Yeah. I mean, you guys catch the very first phrase that we read? When the hour came. You know, you see all through Scripture, Jesus saying, the hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet arrived. It's, it's not yet time to do what I came to do. And now it's the moment. The hour has come. And to Bruce's point, Jesus had celebrated at least two other Passovers with his disciples before this, because his ministry was three years, and Passover was an annual feast. But what was different about this one is it was a culmination of everything that he promised. And what was different about this one is that Jesus breaks the script of the Passover. I don't know if you've ever been to a Passover meal or a Seder meal, but there is a very specific script that you have to follow. The youngest person at the table asks the oldest person at the table, what is different about this night than every other night? And there's a series of question and answers revealing the story of how God chose the Hebrew people, how he rescued them from Egypt, how they wandered through the desert, and every single food uh, and item at the table has significance in the story. There's a lot of symbolism. And in the Passover meal, there's a series of four cups of wine that are shared. And the third cup is called the, the cup of thanksgiving, or the blessing cup. And that's the one that's here because Jesus blesses the cup. We have that in the language. But then what Jesus does is something that nobody was allowed to do and that had ever done before. He changes the words. These were not the words of the Passover. And then he says, this is my blood. Well, let me get it right from this, this one. Um, and he took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that from this time on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he stops. He doesn't finish the meal. And so the disciples would have been like, Jesus, did you like skip a page in the manual? Like, is everything okay? Like, we got to do the Passover. Like, we've been doing this for like thousands of years, or not thousands, hundreds of years as a Hebrew people. Like, we all know how to do this. Jesus, like, What's going on? It would have been very clear that Jesus was doing something very significant. And what's interesting is he says, I shall not drink again of the cup um, of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew, uh, renewed in, or anew in the kingdom. The very next time we see him drinking wine is when he's on the cross, offering himself as the Lamb of God. I heard you guys talking about this a little bit over here. He is the Lamb of God, just like the Passover Lamb was offered to rescue them from death and save them from the angel of death. Jesus is the Lamb of God in the new Passover meal, the Mass. And we commemorate that every week when we gather and remember that he saved us from sin and death eternally. We no longer perpetually need to offer sacrifices at a temple. Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for us. He only needed to do it once. And so every time we come to Mass, we remember that. We don't re-sacrifice Jesus. We're not reflecting on his torment. We are recalling that once and for all sacrifice that he made for us. He did something new so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And it's, it's in the language that he uses all throughout his ministry. If you know Jewish culture, if you know the Passover, it's incredibly significant what Jesus does and all of the symbolism he uses, both in his actions and in his words. That it's very clear. This is what he came to do. He came to set up a new sacramental encounter for us with him to have perpetually so that we could have forgiveness of sins. We could be assured of our salvation. And that is completed, not in the Last Supper, but on the cross. Yes. Since um, the, the Jewish faith does not believe that Christ was in fact the Messiah, mm -hmm. why did they still why did they not sacrifice animals after Christ? Uh, some of them did. Oh, they did. Yeah, they continued to, but the temple was destroyed in the year seventy. Uh, Rome destroyed the temple, completely decimated uh, Jerusalem. And so there were local kind of house places of worship and sacrifice that kind of happened as a result. You still have some very Hasidic or Orthodox communities who gather for, you know, bloodletting of animals and offering to God, and, you know, uh, even in the Muslim community too, like offering something. You see like kosher and halal food and cooking. Sometimes they still incorporate that sacrificial aspect or a public offering. But because of sanitation and public health and like... Um, 
um, like what is it called, like um, scandal, scandalous kind of things for, for minors or children who might be there. There are a lot of laws now about how you can and cannot do that just for like public safety and keeping the peace and not upsetting other people who might not partake in that same tradition. But some of them still try some version of this um, because, yeah, they still are awaiting uh, the Messiah. Yeah. I once saw a van that said Jews for Jesus, and I was very confused. So I was like, uh, last time I checked, that means Christians. So like, if anyone knows any of those people, like I'm not trying to criticize, I'm really curious about who they are and like, what they believe. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would love someone to connect me with them, because that's just it. I was like, that, I feel like that's what I am. But <laughs> it was very funny. Anyway, other reflections, thoughts, questions? What else stood out? Yeah. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. and then, um, in the verse 39, that, that whole paragraph there where he says, you know, pray that you may not undergo the test. Mm -hmm. And then a couple sentences later, you know, wake up, you know, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. Mm -hmm. Like he says it twice. What's the test? Just the, the coming persecution probably that's going to come. You know, and I think it's also, you know, scripture, we can interpret it as what did it mean at the time, but also what does it mean for us now? And for us now, like, we never know when our end is going to happen, you know? And so if we're kind of sleeping on the job as Christians, if we're not really doing our best to follow the Lord, to be really scrutinous with the things that we struggle with or the habits that we want to form, of really following him faithfully as his disciples, then, like, you know, we're, we're risking eternity. We're risking, like, not being with him in heaven forever if we're willing to kind of, like, play around with our salvation and, like, wait till we get up off our butts and just say like, all right, God, like, no, I really want to follow you. Even though I'm not perfect and I'll still mess up, like, I want to keep running after you. So that encouragement of like, keep trying, keep like, you know, don't fall asleep on the job here. You know, like, this is what I came to do. This is like the high point, the high moment. I see a lot of like uh, comparisons with this moment and like, at like what Jesus probably says to most of us when we're at mass, right? Like, Stop sleeping. Like, you can, come on. Like, this is it. Like, wake up. Like, this is the most important thing that you will do all week. Like, the creator of the universe, through his power, is manifesting, and Jesus himself is there present on the altar, body, blood, soul, and divinity for us to receive, just like a wedding ceremony. We walk down the aisle to say, amen, I do, to receive him. We wouldn't act like that at our wedding. Like, I wasn't falling asleep at my wedding. I was, like, overjoyed, so happy to marry my bride. And, like, at any wedding, I'm still happy, even if it's, like, I don't even know the couple, or if I'm like, I don't know if this is going to last, or like, whatever, I'm still like, it's a wedding, come on, like, let's go. So, like, it's, it's, the mass is so much more than all of that, right? It's so much more than that. And so, I hear those words, you know, convicting to me, and like, how am I participating in the mass? Am I, how am I participating in just the Christian life? And like, what I do day in and day out? Am I falling asleep on the job? Am I being kind of lazy in my faith? Or am I really trying to strive for something better? Yeah, Jordan. Uh, I, I was just wondering about why the uh, Peter denying Christ three times and, and then the cock crows, why that piece is actually in here. Yeah. Why, why was that just to kind of nail it down with Peter that you know, Jesus really was the Messiah? Because yeah. I was, yeah. I thought that he, I mean, he's, 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 he uses the words saying, yes, you are, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't know, it's just, it's, it was, in my mind, it was just like one last thing, okay, Peter, you know, hit you on, hit you on the head with a hammer, yeah. and, you know, you're going to, you're going to deny me three times, and yeah. turn up he does, and, and I don't know, maybe it changes his view. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's reassuring for all of us, right? That, like, the first pope, the most important person that Jesus chose to start the church was, like, a messed up human like the rest of us, right? Like, how encouraging that is, right? That, like, even he, and what's interesting is when Jesus says, like, the person who's going to betray me is sitting here, what do they do? They debate among themselves who it is because they don't know. They all think it could be them. And I think when this happened to Peter, when he denied Jesus three times, I think he thought it was him. I think he thought, I'm the one who betrayed Jesus. I'm the one he was talking about, and how destitute that would have make him, made him feel. But we also have the story of his redemption, right? I think it's in the, the account uh, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus appears to them when they're fishing, uh, Peter and I think six or seven other of the apostles, and they have breakfast together, and he says, Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. 
Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my lambs. You know, he redeems that. It's a good reminder for us that, like, no matter how high we get on the spiritual journey, no matter how far advanced we are, like, we still need to admit our brokenness, our faults, our humility. We can't get puffed up in our faith and think that we're better than other people. But at the same time, even in that place, God gives abundant mercy. When we come back to him, when we're ready and willing to repent, when we acknowledge the ways that we've betrayed, we're all, in some way, the betrayer. And yet we're all redeemed as well. The other reason I really like this is in here is because it tells you that the Gospels are true. Because Jesus didn't write any of this down. This was written down by the apostles and the first followers of Jesus. If they made this up, worst possible resume to make for yourself, right? The details that they left in here, like Peter is like probably fine, like writing like Matthew 16, like this is where Jesus told me I was going to start the church and all of this, and I'm so great. But I guess I can't leave out the fact that like three verses later, he calls me Satan and tells him me to get behind him. Like, you know, he leaves in all of the gruesome details of his humanity and the fact that he constantly puts his foot in his mouth, constantly has no idea. I mean, the, all through here, the apostles are like, we don't get it. Even in this story, when in, in, this is in instructions for the time of crisis in 2235, when he's like, remember when I sent you out with nothing? Now you're going to wish you had stuff. Like, take up your sword, your sack, your sandals. And he's trying to prepare them for the fact that, like, the time is now. And they don't get it. And they're like, Jesus, there's two swords here. And so what does he say? He's like, it's enough. Like, he's just like, I'm done. Like, you guys don't get it. Like, and, and then he just leaves and goes to the garden to go pray. Like, how human that is. That's so beautiful. Like, that's who we are as church. We don't need to put on a mask. We don't need to put on a fake persona. Like, we come to Jesus as we are. He loves us as we are. It's that phrase I always repeat. You don't need to change in order for God to love you. But once you realize how much God loves you, it will change you. He meets us where we are. And that, I think, is a beautiful detail, why these things are included in here, why this, like, denial of Peter. And I think it's historically factual. Like, why make that up then if it didn't happen? And the humility that Peter and the apostles had to include all these details so that we know that when we hear the word church, we're not talking about a museum for saints. We're talking about a hospital for sinners. We're talking about a place where everyone is welcome. Everyone is accepted as they are. And despite our faults, our failures, our brokenness, Jesus is constantly going to reach out and redeem us. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, do we know the exact date of um, when this is happening? Because there was an eclipse, mm -hmm. right? So, and there's a Passover like three days before, so. Yes, I believe the year, I believe the exact date, it was April 3rd at 3 p.m. in the year 33 AD. They retroactively looked at the skies and the eclipses in that region. And so the birth of Jesus is a little less fuzzy. You know, it's around zero, but it could be as early as 2 to 4 BC, like our, our modern calendar. So he may have even been older than we typically typically attribute to him, um, him to be. But uh, we know definitively, like, I believe the exact date is April 3rd. So it was a yesterday, Sunday. Yeah, April 3rd, 33 AD, um, at 3 in the afternoon. Oh. I have a friend whose birthday is April 3rd, and she told me that. I'm kind of depressed. Like, <laughs> yeah, my birthday was the day Jesus was crucified. <laughs> so, well, at least I'll never forget it. So, yeah. Emily. When Jesus speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. is he alluding to the fact that his mom is going to suffer watching him die? Uh, can you tell me the verse where that is? It says, I don't have the exact number, but it says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, the womb, uh, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nurse. So I don't know if he's referencing his mom. Well, he's referencing all of the women who are mourning. And so when he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, he's attaching these women who are mourning to a city that has known a lot of mourning as well. So like this phrase, daughters of Jerusalem, I believe it shows up in some of the Psalms and some of the Old Testament prayers associated with the mourning that happened when Jerusalem was destroyed by uh, the Babylonians when they were taken into exile about five or 600 years before Jesus. And so it's kind of a lamenting phrase, you know, like daughters of Jerusalem, daughters of the, the, the city where there has been experienced a lot of loss and you're being taken into a period that seems like exile. Jesus is making an illusion here that even though the temple's not being destroyed again, 
the, the temple of his body is being destroyed and raised up. And even though it might feel like you're going to be in exile, especially the next three days while Jesus is buried, there is going to be a return. There is going to be redemption. So I think he uses it more as like a title. Um, but I, I don't think that implies that they're all from Jerusalem because they obviously been journeying with him. Many are probably from Galilee. His mother is among them um, and things like that. So it's a sign that um, who he's talking to, why he's saying that. And then also this phrase, blessed are the bear in the wombs that never bore, basically saying like, um, you're going to wish that you didn't have like children or future generations. You're going to wish that like all of this would crumble upon you because of the coming persecution, because of the suffering you're enduring, because of your grieving. Um, he's recognizing like um, the hardship that will come and trying to meet them there in that moment. And I wouldn't even say maybe that he's even encouraging them there, but he's at least trying to acknowledge like and prepare them for the fact that like, yes, you can mourn now, but more is coming. So be ready. Kind of the same quip he gives to the apostles when they fall asleep in the garden, in a different different sense. Yeah, Bruce. Can I throw in an unrelated verse that caught my attention this week? Please. As a Protestant, I was raised with John 3.16. That, that told me how to get eternal life by believing in Jesus mm -hmm. the Lord. That particular sentence, as I see it, is not something Jesus said. It was something John said. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the source, the main source. In John 8, verse 51, I ran across this this week. Jesus said, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Yeah. So if you need a Catholic verse to hang on to and you don't like the Protestant one, <laughs> here's one you might want to reread. John 8, 51. But that verse, John 3, 16, that's why so many people memorize it, because it's just it's it gets to the point, right? It's just that beautiful, poignant, like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that we might not perish but have eternal life. Like that's that's what it's about, you know. But I think I've been reflecting a lot on this this past week. That, you know, where we ended is not the end of the story, obviously. And if it were the end of the story, if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and he was just a, a nice guy who did nice things and healed people, but he never rose from the dead, everything would be meaningless. Scripture says, if Christ has not risen, your faith is in vain. So, like, the resurrection, this is why Easter is so important. This is why we really reflect on Holy Week and we really journey through it, because of, not because of the events necessarily that we're commemorating, because but because of everything they're pointing toward. That the most important, most impactful, most joyful, transformative event in all of human history was the resurrection of Jesus. Now, it's not like people are getting resurrected like every other Friday. You know, like this is the only person to do this ever in history, and he claimed to be God, and that demands a response. You know, someone says, I, I am God, and I'm going to approve it, approve it to you by dying and raising from the dead. And we have massive amounts of historical evidence and eyewitness testimony that say that he did, even beyond biblical manuscripts. That's something that really begs the question. Do we live like a resurrection people? And I was reflecting on this. I was listening to some podcasts, and it, you, you reminded me, Bruce, when you were bringing up kind of the difference between Protestants and Catholics. And I was thinking about the way some of our brothers and sisters who are Protestants worship and, and, and how I envy sometimes that I think in Protestant churches, this non-Catholic Christian churches, um, they emphasize first the resurrection, the joy of the resurrection. And like that's why there's so much energy and so much hype and like so much community and so much like kind of just very vibrancy there. But eventually, and what a lot of uh, someone in this podcast was critiquing, who was a, a Protestant pastor, was critiquing was that like eventually like kind of that can get old, especially when people come week after week after week and then they start to suffer or have these different things happen to them that aren't, they don't match up with this joyful resurrection hope and they have, it doesn't make any sense without the crucifixion before it. And I feel that as Catholics, we have the opposite problem. We spend a lot of time reflecting on like what Jesus did for us, that he died for our sins, he died for our sins, and we focus on sins, sins, sins. That's why we have this phrase like Catholic guilt, right? That it hangs over us because we're so reflecting on that that we forget the joy of the resurrection. And it just shows like how the, those spiritualities need each other. How like the divide that we've experienced over the past 500 years in the church and all these denominations is so heartbreaking because we all need each other. We're all kind of incomplete without that spirituality that has sometimes been lost. And even though we have a very comprehensive 
spiritual tradition in the Catholic Church, like it's very um, disheartening to me sometimes to see the lack of hope that we have because we are a resurrection people. So St. Augustine said, and um, John Paul II would quote him all the time, we are a resurrection people and our song is Alleluia. When people walk into Mass, so they look around and see, wow, these are resurrection people and they look like their song is Alleluia. It's like, that person looks like bored to tears. I think it's probably like, you know, that person looks like they can't wait to leave, you know? Like that's, I think, sometimes the reality. And that's okay, like I said, we're human. We, we're not gonna do this perfectly, but I think it's important like, to recognize the gravity of what Jesus did for us, but also that it means nothing without the resurrection. And like, does that compel us to live with Easter joy as Easter people? You know, I think Pope Francis once said that like every wedding mass is, is, a, is a wedding ceremony, or every, every mass is a wedding ceremony, but when you walk in, most people look like they're at a funeral. And he wrote in an ecumenical document, like this is in a church document, he wrote the word sourpusses. I just love, I love that the word sourpusses is in an official church document. I think it's in Evangelii Gaudium, which is one of his first documents. That like, that's how he criticizes us, you know? And the Catholics have the nickname as Frozen Chosen, you know, that we just kind of stand there, we're not very vibrant. Or, but when you really get to the heart of what it is, and when you meet someone in the Catholic Church or in another tradition who really gets it, who really understands how Jesus transforms your life because he's risen from the dead. He can turn any crucifixion moment, any suffering moment in your life, any darkness into something beautiful. Then it oozes out of people and they have that resurrection joy and we want it, right? We meet people like that, we're just attracted to them. We just like gravitate toward them. I was at High Tide Coffee this week on the bus and I walked in and I was having like, some, like my wife and I both take alone time where we just have time to like not have the children biting us and like just be on our own. and. I walk in and this girl walks up to the counter who's working there and immediately this is like vibrancy came off her and immediately I knew I was like this girl believes in Jesus like there's just no way that she doesn't and it just it like shot out of her I was like jealous and I was just like I found myself just like wait what am I here for like just looking at her like just like this is so incredible and then I ordered and I sit down and I'm reading my Bible and she comes over like 15 minutes she's like oh my gosh I love your Bible we love having Bibles in here and her friend was there and they were just talking about a Bible study they went to and it turned out that was true, but it was just like, it was obvious, you know? And I just, I miss, I miss the times in history when Catholics dominated that arena. And I think we can do it again, but we have to remember when we hear this story, it's not the end. Sorry, that was a whole diatribe, but like, Amen. We're resurrection people. Let's act like it. Anyways, other things uh, that stood out, other questions you have, or just things that, that stood out to you. You don't need to share why or have a question. Yes, Faye. Well, it, you saying all of that, it kind of makes me think of the, the two uh, guys on either side of Jesus. Yes. Right? The one guy's like, hey, you're the Christ. Help us. You know, like, you know, very loose in his faith. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy's like, no, that's not the way we do it. Yeah. Right? And so... It, right there is a good example of, of the two types of Christians we could be. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that both of them asked Jesus to save them? Like, right, the, 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 the one that's called the bad thief, his name is Gestus. Gestus, who's, if you're looking at a depiction of the crucifixion, Gestus is always on this side, on the right. That side. On the right. <laughs> uh, on Jesus' left. Yeah. He asks to save yourself and us. But he's doing it for selfish reasons. He's not repenting. He's not saying he's sorry. He's just like, you've got the power. Come on, man. Like, help me out. Give me the homie hookup. Like, I don't want to be up here. You know? And then the other guy is like, come on. Like, we, we're up here for a good reason. Like, we're supposed to be here. And then, so he appeals to Jesus' mercy and says, what does he say? Remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, he doesn't say, like, save me. He just says, like, hey, if you can think of me, like, in this moment, that would be great. You know, no assurance though, no begging or anything. And he is the one who is redeemed. His name was Dismas. He's a saint in the Catholic Church, Saint Dismas, one of the earliest saints. We, we actually have several people in here. I, I can't remember if Malchus, the guy whose ear was cut off, if he became a saint, I don't remember. But Longinus, the centurion who witnessed what happened, uh, he's a saint in the church as well, Saint Longinus. So, yeah, crazy. Yes? Kind of on that note, you know, there's multiple times from the, uh, when they're arguing about who's the greatest, or even Peter denying Jesus. You know, there's a consistent, like, Jesus must have been so frustrated. Just, oh my gosh, yeah. Just like, he's telling them it's not about you. 
It's not about yeah. me, it's about everybody else. It's this constant back and forth between like, what you just said, the selflessness mm -hmm. versus the selfishness. Yeah. Um, because it's it's really human thing to do to be afraid, like in Peter's position, to say, oh, no, 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 not with that guy. Mm -hmm. But it's to go, you know, beside himself to go say, yeah, I am with that person. And it's not about the consequences that have to be. Yeah. But I'm, you know, by them. Yeah. Um, and so that's just, it's just something that, that it's consistent in all scripture, but man, Jesus must have been so fresh. And they're probably like just staring at him like totally. all the time. He's like, just, it's not about this. Yeah. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, it constantly is like, and the disciples did not understand. Yeah. Just like totally didn't get it. And I, I don't like in our tradition how we over stoicize Jesus and many of the figures of church history. Like we make them these prim, proper, like everyone's in a statue like this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, like, they're just like sleep living, you know, it's just like that's not reality, you know, like, like Jesus was in his early 30s. The only one of the apostles that we have any evidence that was married was Peter. And the average age of marriage for a man was sometime like 16 to 25, you know, years old, probably at the time. Uh, we know that John was the youngest. He was a teenager. So imagine like me, I'm about Jesus's age at the end of his ministry trying to corral constantly and teach a group of 12 dudes from like 13 to 30 <laughs> for three years living together. Like, do you really, like it would be more like me trying to run a kindergarten class. Like this is kind of the reality that Jesus was dealing with. So yeah, he's constantly frustrated. People constantly didn't get it. And I, 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 I mourn the humanity that's missing in some of our depictions of art and some of our understanding of who these people really were. We imagine them as these far off legendary figures like Zeus or Hercules and like they're, we see them depicted in paintings as these perfect stoic individuals and it's like no sainthood is possible for everyone and no saint like what is what is the saying every saint had a past and every sinner has a future you know and i think we miss when we talk about saints all of the messy stuff from their past and some of them like right up until the moment they died there's one saint uh oh i'm not gonna remember his name maybe someone here knows it he was a uh, he was an opium addict in china and he was addicted to opium until the moment he died but he was a martyr from some big Christian rebellion that happened. Is uh, Paul or Matt something? Is he has a, he has a um, hard to pronounce last name in, in Chinese? Um, someone who can look it up, look him up, maybe uh, maybe it'll come to me. But um, like the, that's a story of saints. You know, Saint Augustine had a child out of wedlock. Saint Bartolo Longo was a satanic priest. Saint Mary of Egypt used to go on pilgrimage routes to Jerusalem as a prostitute to get pilgrims to sleep with her to make money. And then she became a saint and had a conversion. Like these are messy human people who were broken, had real problems, real things happening to them. And we like stoicize them as these people. Like even icons of Saint Mary of Egypt, she's just like, hmm. She's like, really, lady? Like, you know, I think it's probably a little more spicy than that. Like, given your history, like. And she's probably up in heaven, like, come on, like, I was more of a party girl than that. Like, you know, like, pay me who I really was, this, like, vibrant woman who had this profound conversion and not this just, like, you know, it's just, it bothers me. So I think, like, paying attention to these details, like, the real humanity in this, because then we can connect to it, right? Then we see ourselves in the story. It's really hard for me to see myself in, like, a, you know, a prayer card or a church icon or stained glass window. And they're beautiful things and they educate and they're, they're really great works of art. I'm not knocking them for that, but like we can't dehumanize the gospel and the apostles and Jesus and sainthood. Like Jesus came to live a human life to show us how to live a human life. Um, he didn't divorce himself from humanity to ask, act like we need to ascend it. Like he said, redemption is possible through your humanity. And I'm going to show you that by coming and living a human life. And that's just a really beautiful thing to keep in mind. And so when we, we listen to this this week, you'll hear it again, and, and I can't remember if it's Good Friday or Palm Sunday where we get to kind of participate in it, but you'll, you'll hear it. And I just really want to encourage you to enter into the scene again, really see those human characters and qualities, pay attention to how you would feel if you were there, who you identify with, and recognize, like, even if you're in the darkest part of your journey or your life right now, like, even these apostles who traveled with Jesus for three years and didn't get it, many of whom abandoned and betrayed him, there's redemption possible. Jesus brings them back. He always finds a way. He's always reaching out in his mercy. And that's what this is about. But it's also not the end of the story. It leads to the resurrection, and it should bring us joy, not sorrow. Yes, we, we contemplate these things, and it makes us, it grieves, we grieve the loss of, 
our Savior in this way because we're responsible. Our sins put him there on that cross. But that should lead to the joy of the resurrection. And that should be what comes out of us each and every day. So let's pray that that would happen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for this time and for just this vibrant discussion and study on your word. Even though we really just scratched the surface of this long passage, we pray, Lord, that this would wash over us this week. We would really be able to enter into this story, contemplate what you did for us, who you are, who you came to be, and the fact that you have risen from the dead. That means you have control over all, life and death. You can redeem anyone and anything if we but come to you in our messy human brokenness and offer who we are to you to follow you as faithfully as we can and keep coming back to you when we mess up. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your forgiveness, for reminding us we don't have to be perfect, reminding us we don't need to change in order for you to love us. But when we realize how much you love us, it will change us. So change us this week. Help us to be more and more conformed to your most sacred heart, to becoming the resurrection people you've called us to be. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.